well, yes, I am concerned about what they're watching. Young minds take in a great deal of what they see, and we can't always be there to check. Face it, your kids are gonna grow up with TV. I couldn't be happier that cable has these channels and shows specially for young people and families. And you know what? There are times I'm happy just to sit down and watch right along with them. Cable TV, bringing it all home. Hi, I'm Rob Van Adderkom, and welcome to UNBC's first foray into the world of television broadcasting, otherwise known as Spotlight on UNBC. The purpose of this monthly half-hour program is simple, to give you more information about what's happening at UNBC. As you can see, the laboratory and library buildings are in the process of being built. Construction of the Prince George campus and the tendering process has come under fire recently. We'll have a story on that this program. Also coming up, a talk with UNBC's first students, milestones from 1992, and highlights from a recent First Nations Forum held in Terrace. That and more is coming up. Stay tuned. UNBC's first semester began in September of 1992. Semester number two began a few weeks ago with students from Kitimat to Williams Lake to Charlie Lake and all points in between. While the Prince George campus is being built on Cranbrook Hill, the French Canadian Club is the teaching center in Prince George and we caught up with three students just before classes resumed. Basically this was your first experience with a university and the first experience for UNBC offering courses. What's sort of your perception of how the first semester went? Uh, good, good response, bad, was it was a lot harder than you thought? What's it was a lot harder than I thought. I thought, oh, UNBC, no problem, it'll be easy, but it was, it was definitely university level courses, and I, I had five courses, and it was a heavy workload, but I came out okay in the end. What were some of the problems? Textbooks, <laughs> there was no textbooks in the beginning. They, failed to order them or I don't know what happened but we went through a couple months or a month anyways with no textbooks and just a whole bunch of photocopies so that was a little bit of a setback. Well it's been a real challenge. Um, I went to uni the University of Victoria for a few years a long time ago and then I've taken some courses for CNC. Um, these are, are definitely like Nikki said they're university level courses. The expectations are a little bit higher, I think, and um, it was a challenge. Well, right now, I'm taking one course a semester just to kind of break back into it. Um, eventually, I'll get a degree through UN UNBC. Um, if I take one course a semester, it'll take 10 years, so hopefully I'll be able to speed that up, like Nikki in 1994, when the campus is open and ready to go. I'm hoping that I can, you know, get two or three a semester. I don't work, so I was looking for something that that I could fill in some time and maybe do something a little intellectual instead of just, um, you know, staying at home. And in August, it was about the, around the middle of the month that I heard about these classes even coming out. And up until then, I hadn't even known about it. So I, you know, you sort of put it off, put it off, and I signed up at the last minute. And, you know, there you go. But there were a lot of people didn't even realize it. My Monday night course, there's about 20 people in the class. Um, that's a nice size for uh, uh, talking between people. Um, and uh, my other class, uh, English, is uh, there's two people in the class. So it's a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's kind of shocking to have only two people in the class. Um, almost a little intimidating. But uh, there's going to be a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. It should be interesting how the class goes. I'm really interested to see how a, a two-member class is going to work. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll do third year this year, fourth through next year, and then by then, 94, the university should be open, and I'll do my education program then. I just finished uh, my first two years of the program that I'm going into at CNC, and I have a half a year to wait to get into the program that I want, which is the professional development program at um, SFU. So I decided that I would take two 
um, classes here of the 300 level, um, just to give the PDP program an idea that I can handle 300 level courses. Um, meanwhile, ra hopefully raising my GPA, um, getting some experience, seeing if uh, 300 level courses are uh, something that I can handle. Uh, also, I'm doing some other things that are going to help me to get into the program. So, basically, helping me to get into what I want. For myself, I wanted to get in, get into the routine of, of school again right away. So that's great. The class sizes right now are small, so you get lots of indi individual attention. And, and if you're thinking about going back to school, going back to U UMBC right now, now's the time to get in while the class sizes are small. The beginning of classes was one highlight from 1992, but there were many more, according to UNBC President Jeffrey Weller. Well, I think one of the one of the highlights is being able to go to the topping off of the uh, library building uh, last fall, and and thinking that uh, there was absolutely nothing up on the hill there uh, in February, and uh, so I mean that was really significant. Another significant thing is we've hired another. 50 or 60 staff uh, during the year, and we're now at uh, now at 90. Um, we have completed a lot of uh, program planning. We've signed the uh, protocols with the three northern uh, colleges, and uh, there've been all kinds of very significant developments this year. What about for 1993? What sort of things can we expect to see then, in terms of, I guess, in terms of developments of UNBC's regional operations? I guess we'll take center stage, and the campus will become nearing completion. That's right, yes. We, uh, we will, of course, be repeating the, uh, the quick starts. We'll be offering programs in uh, Terrace and uh, Prince George and uh, Fort, uh, Fort St. John, Dawson Creek. Uh, we'll uh, be uh, refining the protocols. We'll be working out regional academic plans with the, uh, with the three northern colleges, not only regional plans, but also some community-specific uh, plans. We'll see the hiring of another 110 uh, faculty members and of course the staff needed to support them. We'll see the completion of the uh, buildings in uh, Prince George. Um, of course it's not just a matter of uh, completing the buildings, we also have to buy huge amounts of scientific equipment which has to be installed and calibrated and, uh, and gotten ready for the students coming in the, uh, in the fall of, uh, of 94. So uh, we have a tremendous amount uh, ahead of us. What about, you've been here just over two years now, um, Looking back on it, what's sort of your reaction to, to the past two years in, in general? I guess a, <laughs> some trying times, I guess, as it is for starting up anything new, but I guess some... Yeah. some well, by and large, it's been, it's been fascinating. And when I first came, it was, uh, uh, there was no site. Uh, we had, uh, I think, about three staff, uh, a treasurer, uh, two secretaries, and myself. Um, and now we have buildings up, we have uh, quite a large staff, several locations for buildings, uh, and, uh, and we're well underway. We certainly have survived all kinds of ups and downs, but there's been an uh, incredibly rapid uh, pace of progress. What about the, the feelings in the region? Do you think that uh, as UNBC is becoming more of a reality, that people are, are starting to see it as, as being something instead of just a dream? Well, I think so, and I hope so. I, I mean, I hope the fact that we've actually started offering uh, courses has helped uh, that. I think uh, that the uh, signing of the protocols with the, with the colleges uh, should have helped as well because uh, they state that uh, eight or nine very specific programs will be available throughout northern uh, British Columbia and we're going to go into the detailed planning uh, on that. Uh, we've had several consultants come in to look at programs that are, are, are specific to uh, regions other than Prince George. So I'm hoping that people will uh, believing that we are indeed uh, coming and we intend to come right across northern British Columbia. Spotlight on UNBC will be right back with news about construction of the Prince George campus. Well, yes, I am concerned about what they're watching. Young minds take in a great deal of what they see, and we can't always be there to check. Face it, your kids are going to grow up with TV. I couldn't be happier that cable has these channels and shows specially for young people and families. And you know what? There are times I'm happy just to sit down and watch right along with them. Cable TV, bringing it all home.
Welcome back to the Cranbrook Hill construction site. Behind me you can see the library building. Just to give you a quick tour and a brief orientation of the layout of the site, right in front of me is the administration building. Over to my right is the conference and fitness center. The laboratory research center is in the back, and then the library and classroom complex again. And then over to my left, we overlook the city of Prince George. Also interconnecting all the main buildings is called the Agora. It's basically a building that connects everything together so that on cold winter days like this one, you won't have to go outside to go from the admin building, for example, to the library. Instead, you could travel indoors through the Agora. Phase one of these buildings is now virtually complete. UNBC has decided to lump phases two and three into one large contract worth about $50 million. That has angered the Prince George Construction Association. They want at least the opportunity to bid on each building separately because no single northern contractor is large enough to bid on the whole complex as one single project. The Prince George Construction Association felt so strongly on the matter that they issued a news release, put a full-page ad in the newspaper, and demonstrated outside UNBC's Prince George offices. To understand the complexities of the issue, I spoke with Dean Cooper, Vice President Administration at UNBC. He oversees construction of all buildings on campus. During an interview in the partially completed UNBC library, he explained that UNBC went the single tender route because of the advice of both the project managers and the cost consultants. Well, what we had to do is look at the entire cost to the university, uh, which includes uh, the costs of the tenders, as well as the additional costs that we have to anticipate that we're going to expect during that process. Their advice is that with six contractors on site, the potential for cost increases, the cost of contingencies, change orders was far greater than if we had a single contractor. And if you look at the example of what it would be like if you were building a house and you had six contractors, one for each room of the house, building the house, as opposed to having a single contractor doing that, the potential for problems with six is far greater than with one. And that's the kind of situation that we have at the university, the way the buildings are put together. And so their advice was, and in their experience, they felt that we had to provide uh, an additional roughly $2 million to handle those additional costs that uh, they anticipate that we could run into for the six contractors. Considering all of that, uh, we, the uh, IGC felt that they really didn't have any other alternative but to consider the total impact of the cost of the university and go with a single contract. The final decision was made by the university's Interim Governing Council, or IGC, and the reasons were outlined at a news conference. It is important that the public understand that there are very stringent rules governing the awarding of contracts funded by government. Prior to going to tender, the university must demonstrate to the Ministry of Advanced Education that the proposed facilities can be constructed within the available budget. The consultants have advised that $2 million can be saved by having one contractor complete the job. We wish very much that this were not so. We have every reason to believe our quantity surveyors, whose view is impartial and is based on professional experience, broadly accepted in the construction industry. We need the $2 million in savings to remain on budget and there is no way we can proceed to issue the tenders without those savings in our analysis. The only way we could proceed otherwise is with the consent of the Minister of Advanced Education. The Minister has indicated that there is no way he will permit us to risk such additional expenditures in the face of reports, in the face of the reports of our consultants. Well, you know, two million dollars is significant. Uh in allocating our budgets, we had to set aside a certain amount for the furnishings and equipment and so on for the, uh, for the campus. The library alone here that we're standing in, the books, the initial budget for the books in this library is $4 million. Now, $2 million is half of the total allocation that we have for the books in the library. Uh, we could apply you know, similar analogies of, of other areas. We were certainly concerned, and the board was certainly concerned, that if we would remove any of those dollars from our furnishings and equipment, it could seriously impact the quality of the materials that the students would have to work with when they come to this university. 
and we didn't feel that we could make those kind of compromises. We had to have uh, buildings and a university that was adequately equipped and furnished in order for the students to be able to have the resources they needed to get their education. Dean Cooper says the IGC realized it would not be a popular decision and added that it was very difficult to make. Well, as far as difficulty is concerned, I think that it's summed up in the statement that was made by Tom Stedman, who was a member of our IGC, who said, I don't like the decision, but I don't feel we have any other alternative. And I think that the, the Prince George Campus Committee, who is directly responsible for this, and our IGC, have looked at this thing a number of times. It took us better than three months to go through this and respond to questions and look at all the different alternatives that we had in, in considering the, the issue. Uh, certainly, uh, it was not taken lightly. Uh, and our, uh, I think they, they came down to the conclusion that they didn't like to make the decision. They recognized the impact uh, that it may have on the local Prince George Construction Association. But they really felt in the best interest of the university and the students at, Northern, at the University of Northern British Columbia, we really didn't have any other alternative but to move in that direction. As far as the, uh, a single contractor or, or six contractors, uh, I don't see that that's going to have any impact at all on the workforce from Northern British Columbia. At the present time, we have a contractor on site who is doing all of the buildings at the present time, and their head office is in Vancouver. They only have, I think, two or three people here on site. All of the rest of the people are hired locally, uh, and they will continue to make up the workforce. Uh, a contractor just cannot be competitive if they have to bring the workers in from outside the area, pay the transportation costs, room and board costs, and so on. So we don't see any change in that happening uh, in the future. We anticipate that all the workers are going to be from uh, Northern British Columbia. Normally, in a major contract like this, you can expect that 40% of the cost will be in labor. So with this, the total complex that we're looking at here, uh, uh, in excess of $80 million, uh, you take 40% of that, we're looking at anywhere between 32 and $40 million in wages with the very large majority of those dollars coming directly to the workers from Northern British Columbia. What about in terms of supplies? Concrete, for example, you build the library, what about that? that well, certainly all of the concrete uh, things of that nature are all uh, provided by local suppliers. Uh, there will be some uh, materials, of course, uh, equipment that will be coming in from elsewhere that we don't manufacture here. But wherever possible, they will try and buy locally uh, and work with local suppliers. There's no question that they can get better quantity prices by buying somewhere else. They may do that, but certainly they will, uh, have all the local uh, contractors have the opportunity to provide pricing and so on on those areas. But uh, major steel, concrete, all of those things all come from the local industry. Right here we have the roof of one of the lecture halls on campus. Despite all the attention being given the single contract, there will still be a lot of opportunities for northern contractors to take part on campus. For example, the apartment buildings are being built on that hill back there in the wooded area. In addition, the townhouses, the daycare center, the maintenance building, paving, landscaping, and interior furnishings are all still available to northern contractors. They're being kept small to allow them the opportunity to bid. Spotlight on UNBC is one way to increase awareness about the university, and these are others. First of all, to the guide to UNBC. This is a brand new document, 72 pages long, which contains information on proposed degree programs, the committees, the faculties, the structure of UNBC, computing and telecommunications, the library, co-op education, student services, the facilities, the region. Basically, everything you need to know about UNBC is contained in this book, it's available by calling 565-5666. By leaving your name and address, a guide will then be sent to you. Otherwise, drop by the downtown Prince George UNBC office or at Mosquito Books, which is located at 5th and Dominion in Prince George. Next, the UNBC update, the UN University's newsletter. It's produced six times a year, every two months, and sent to about 8,000 people. The progress was sent to 120,000 mailboxes in northern BC. It basically tells the UNBC story, where it's been and where it's going. A new one will be sent out in about three months from now. Next, we have the poster, which is displayed around Prince George. It tells of various public activities and events, such as the academic lectures. Over the next few months, UNBC will be hiring 40 academic staff, 
and each of the shortlisted candidates are required to give public lectures on their area of expertise as part of the interview process. The lecture schedule is also available by calling the info line. It's available by calling 565-5678. Finally, there's a wide array of brochures that UNBC has produced, such as the introduction brochure. There's also the Winter 1993 program, the Conference Center, Co-op Education, and International Studies. So there's a wide array of material available for more information about UNBC. Feel free to call the main switchboard at 565-5555 for more information on any of these. Next, we have an interview with Audrey McKay, one of the interim governing council members who took part in a recent First Nations Forum in Terrace. The most important question that kept coming up was the uh, loss of language, culture, and history. And in that area also, I, th I think it's not only in this area where language and culture is lost. It's all through our, uh, all through our country. And it has been said that when there is no language, uh, or culture, because we see those as uh, being together, there is no life. So again, they see this as uh, one of the number one priorities that they would like to see UNBC give support to, and that's the teaching of the uh, language, culture, and history. The Terrace Forum was a follow-up to a meeting held in Prince George in October. In addition to discussion on proposed UNBC language and culture courses, the terms of reference and membership of a First Nations Council was on the agenda. And now to wrap up this edition of Spotlight on UNBC, since June of last year, UNBC has been hosting a public lecture series, and speakers have so far included Roberta Bondar, Joe Clark, and Gordon Wilson. But certainly the most amusing talk to date was given by Stuart McLean, who read selections from his book, Welcome home at Mosquito Books. I, w I went to Fox Warren because I wanted to find out about hockey again. I, I had left, I felt hockey had kind of gone away from me somehow. Where, where is Fox Warren? Fox Warren is uh, in the uh, south of the north, sort of central, west part of Manitoba. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. No, no, no one really knows where Fox Warren, Manitoba is, actually. It, it moves around on the map. No, it, it's uh, on the Yellowhead Highway, on the, uh, right on the boundary between Saskatchewan and Manitoba, sort of in the middle part there, yeah, the west middle. It, it sort of looks like Steven Spielberg set it down one night, like there was a wheat field there yesterday, and then today there's this town. It's got dirt streets and uh, two grain elevators and... Patricia's Cafe, and a general store with a lamp by the cash register and string up in the ceiling that's coming down so you can tie the flaps of the boxes up and put more in it. And I met M Ron Falloon in, in Patricia's Cafe. Now, Ron is Pat Falloon's daddy. And Pat Falloon, you may know, was drafted right after Eric Lindros by the San Jose Sharks a few years ago. And so hockey is a big thing in Fox Warren. And the San Jose Sharks are a big thing. Ro before he played for San Jose, Pat played for the Spokane Chiefs in uh, Washington. Would that be right, Washington? A and Ron was telling me how he how he he wanted to hear his son play hockey, and how he would he figured the car radio would bring in a Spokane station bet. One night, trying to improve reception because it was sort he could tell it was there in the static somewhere, he wired up the car to the windmill, trying to use the windmill as an antenna. That didn't work. It just then he went driving to all the high spots around the farm, and he finally found one. If he parked the car at a certain angle on this one little knoll, he could pick up the games. And he and Diane would go out there with a bottle of rye on Saturday night, <laughs> watch the antelopes dance around and listen to his son play hockey. I said, Ron? He said, it's not just me. He said, Ray Whitney's dad found if he took a portable radio up on the roof and sat by the chimney, he could hear his son play. <laughs> I thought this was a kind of, this pleased me too, this image of mothers and fathers on Saturday nights 
on rooftops, <laughs> wrapped around a bottle of rye on the prairie. <laughs> it's kind of like the stoplight in Sackville, you know? It's probably st red right now. I, um, Ben Lowe, when I was in Fox War and went to the, went, went to Crawford's Esso for an oil change, he took his car into Crawford's and had them change the oil. And Crawford got talking to him so much, he remembered to drain the oil and put in the new filter, but he forgot to put in the new oil. <laughs> ben didn't notice until he got halfway home when the red light came on and they phoned the station and Crawford came out and put in some oil, but everyone was, you know, the thing about a small town is word gets round, you know. <laughs> Get away with that sort of thing in Toronto, but in Fox Warren, where there's only 155 people living, uh, you don't want to make a mistake like that too much. You, you going to take your car there? They were saying at the cafe the next day. Ron Floon figured it out. He said, what you do after, uh, finally, uh, by the end of the day, Ron had the line, he said, what you do after you have your oil cha changed at Crawford's is you, you coast the car up to the gas pumps and you say, fill her up and check the oil. <laughs> <laughs> My, uh, my, my bill at the hotel at Fox Warren was uh, for two and a half weeks, $65, <laughs> eight bucks a night from uh, Elsie Peach, who, who owns the hotel. Um, I tried to give her more money. She wouldn't take it. She, uh, she, <laughs> she gave me a hat instead. <laughs> Have a cool one at the Kent, it said. Uh, I, I going going before I went to Fox Warren, I phone, phoned Elsie, and uh, my goodness, someone's ripped Fox Warren right out of this book. Huh? Here it is. I phoned her and asked her if I could. I was trying to make a reservation at the Kent. <laughs> I don't think she'd had a guest for several years. <laughs> you want to stay for two weeks? The woman on the telephone had a soft Ukrainian accent. Yes, I said two weeks. Where are you calling from? <laughs> I told you already, Toronto. Toronto? Yes. But how are you going to get here? She sounded incredulous. By plane, I said, to Winnipeg, then by car. You want to stay here over a Saturday night? <laughs> Is that a problem, I asked? No, no, that's no problem. How much then, if I stay two weeks, can you give me a special rate? There was a pause. You sure you want to stay here two weeks? <laughs> yes, I said, maybe more. There was a longer pause. How does $20 a night sound? $20 would be fine. And as I say, when I finally got to the bill, it was eight bucks a night. She said, ah, oh, shit, no one stays here anymore. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I went into the bar one day. I mean, it's essentially, it's a bar, you know, the Kent Hotel. It, uh, <laughs> there was another room. Uh, Elsie, you see, there was nine rooms to sleep in upstairs, but Elsie occupies five herself. She, she, one of them serves as her attic where she keeps her Christmas decorations. One, one's where she gets dressed in the morning. Another's where she keeps the linen. The fourth is where she does her ironing. And on the fifth, she's got a, a jigsaw puzzle laid out on the bed. <laughs> she sometimes goes in there and gets down on her knees and does the jigsaw puzzle. There's the there's the, you come in the front door, there's a room to your right, a room to your left. The room on the right is the bar. The room to the left is, lo looks just like your living room. There's plants and, I mean, and that, you know, and t her television and uh, chairs and easy chairs and family photos and the door stays shut. That's where Elsie spends a lot of her time. I was in there talking to her one day. I said, and I was trying to get it right. I was trying to be a good journalist. I said, what do you call this, Elsie, this room? I thought the lounge or my quarters or the living room. She said, oh, this, she said. This is the licensed dining room. <laughs> Needed it for licensing, you know. She had to have a dining room. I said, she said, see, right over there. And pushed up against the table, the corner, there was a chair, a table with four chairs. She said, in case the inspector comes. <laughs> Stuart McLean actually has closer they, uh, connections to UNBC than just his participation in the Fox public Warren, lecture series. The Fox university's Warren. director of services, yeah, Alistair McLean, is in fact Stuart's brother. Yeah. Thank you for being with us for the inaugural Spotlight on UNBC program. We hope you'll be with us next month to find out more about what's happening 
at the University of Northern British Columbia.